Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag. Now, Mailbag is, of course, the kind of spin-off show, if you will, of AMC Movie Talk, our daily Monday through Friday movie news show on AMC, uh, our YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash AMC Theaters, which is, of course, where you're watching this right now, so I don't even know why I bothered kind of mentioning that. Um, this is a much more casual show than AMC Movie Talk. As you can tell, I'm not in the new studio. I'm in AMC Studio B, um, and this is uh, much more relaxed, much more laid back, very informal, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. Now, um, on AMC Movie Talk every day, we take one or two questions from the mailbag, but on the weekends, all we do is take mailbag questions, and that's it. Mm. And uh, I'm thirsty, as you can tell. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief over at AMC Movie News, and I'm so glad that you guys are joining us today. You know, you're going to notice that I'm alone today. This past week, for those of you who are subscribers to our YouTube channel, was a very big and busy week. Number one, we moved into the new studio. Uh, which has been fantastic so far. Now, we've had some technical issues along the way, some audio issues, some, you know, uh, some other types of minor issues. But I'm telling you, for the first week in this brand new production facility, I'm really happy with how it's gone personally. So there's been moving in, getting all adjusted to that. We crossed um, our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. We crossed 100,000 subscribers. Uh, which to put that in context for you, when we started AMC Movie Talk, the daily show in January, uh, I, we had, I think, 7,000 subscribers. And now here we are just months later and we're at 100,000. And so, you know, thank you guys so much for all your support in doing that. So uh, it's been it's been pretty big. It's been busy. So I decided that this weekend, you know what, just giving everybody the weekend off. Nobody has to come in. Nobody has to get on Skype. It's just going to be me. Everybody deserves the weekend off. And so I decided to give everybody the weekend off. I mean, because everybody from Schnepp and Obviously, Dennis and Amy Rose and Aaron and Chris Lee, they've all worked so hard this week, and I'm so proud of them and everything that they've done. And so they got the weekend off. So today, just you and me, just a couple of film fans sitting around talking about movies because that's what we love so much. All right. With all that out of the way, let's get into the first mailbag question of the day. And the first mailbag question today comes from Jason McCasland, who writes, Months ago, I know there was talk about working uh, in the start of Planet Hulk and World War Hulk into the end of Avengers 2. Is there any current word on the future development? I've wanted a telling of that story in any form, animated, motion comic, live action, for some time now. Thanks for the information. Me wants some Hulk movie, even more so if he's destroying everyone. Um, thanks a lot, Jason. Well, first of all, um, just in case you're not aware, just because the way your question was worded and you're saying I even wanted an animated form, there is an animated um, uh, movie version of uh, Planet Hulk that you can find. It's on Netflix right now. So if you go on Netflix and search for Planet Hulk, I, I think it's about like 50 minutes long. Um, so you can go there and they do have an animated. I don't know if they're planning on making an animated version of World War Hulk or not, but, um, but Planet Hulk's there if you want to see it. Now, what you're really asking about is... Here's how this all went down. A number of months ago, um, a site that has now become notorious for putting out bad information, you know, maybe one out of every five predictions they make, not, not just predictions, they say, this is fact, and then it turns out it's not. But um, they still get the odd one, right? But a number of months ago, a particular site put out word that, guys, this is before we knew it was going to be Age of Ultron and Avengers 2. We know what Avengers 2 is going to be about. It's going to be based on World War Hulk. It's going to be, and then based on Planet Hulk, and they're going to do all this kind of stuff. And everybody, including me, got really excited because I'm, I love the Hulk. I really love the Hulk in the Avengers. That was finally the Hulk we've all been waiting for. And uh, so word got around hey, they're, Marvel's planning on doing, developing, you know, Planet Hulk and going into World War Hulk. That the Hulk, you know, just gets seen as being too powerful and the, you know, maybe he goes on a rampage and destroys a city and, you know, the other Earth heroes decide he's got to be banished into space and blah, blah, blah. In the, in the comic, basically what happens is there's this group, I believe they call themselves the Illuminati, uh, that is, consists of... Uh, Professor X, Mr. Fantastic, Doctor Strange, I think Black Panther. Anyway, about five guys. I can't remember each one of them who was in there. And they decide Hulk's just too dangerous. We were friends with Bruce, but this is too dangerous for Earth. And they blast him in the space, and Hulk winds up landing on this planet and becomes a prisoner and a gladiator. So it's kind of like Gladiator, but with the Hulk, right? 
But then eventually what happens is Hulk takes over this planet. He comes, becomes their king, right? And so then you move into World War Hulk, where Hulk comes back to Earth and he ain't in a good mood for being banished in the first place. And uh, you can imagine what happens from there. So anyway, there was big excitement that they were going to make this movie, right? But soon after that, Kevin Feige came out and, and destroyed the credibility of that rumor, said, nope, no plans for that at all. And so far, Kevin Feige has not really lied when it comes to this stuff. I mean, especially with his outright denial. It's like, no, there are no plans for a... a right now, there's not even any plans for any kind of a Hulk movie, um, let alone a Planet Hulk or a World War Hulk. So... Unfortunately, there is no plans for a Planet Hulk or World War Hulk. That would be pretty badass, although I got to admit that'd be also pretty damn expensive to make. Um, but to tide you over, there is on Netflix a Planet Hulk animated mini movie, sort of. So hopefully that'll hold you over. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Lantonio Jackson. And Lantonio writes, hey guys, big fan and congrats on the new location. Thank you very much, Lantonio. You mentioned about past reservations about being a 30-minute show in the age of a minute and a half attention span. Does this have huge effect on movies? I realize that movies are edited to fit into a certain amount of time. I'm curious to how you know if your movie needs to be 90 minutes or 180 minutes. Um, excellent question, uh, uh, Lantonio. Look, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about when he says the 30 minutes thing, um, when we crossed 100,000 subscribers, I mentioned that we were told by a lot of people, including um, some people at YouTube, that you know a 30-minute daily show, just talking news that's not based on comedy and isn't just filled with really, really hot women, although we have some very beautiful girls at AMC Movie News, I hire those girls because they're smart and they're experts in what they do. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be on air and I wouldn't hire Schnepp and I wouldn't hire myself and I wouldn't hire Dennis. Um, but... Um, but we did a throw, I believe the 30 minute show could work and, and it does work. So I'm really happy about that. But the whole idea about how long should a movie be is one that me and my friends discuss and talk about and debate all the time. And the reality is that the answer is there is no answer. Every film is completely unique. Now, for instance, I've walked out of movies that were an hour and 45 minutes long and I've said, that was about 20 minutes too long, that movie. That movie needed, pardon me, that movie needed to be edited down, it needed to be trimmed up, it was far too long, at 145 minutes, which is about average. You know, 90 minutes to 85 or 105 minutes, that's about the average length of a movie. And I've walked out of some said, you know what, for this particular movie and the way it was structured and the way it was paced, it was about 15 or 20, you should have cut about 15 or 20 minutes out of it, it would have flowed much better and been much better. Uh, then there are really long movies like King Kong. Remember Peter Jackson's King Kong? Didn't like that movie. Um, but I've always said, if you took the scalpel, because Peter Jackson seems to for have forgotten how to edit. Uh, this is what I said at the time anyway, because he had like, these four-hour long cuts of each of the Lord of the Rings films, and he made King Kong like almost three hours long. And I've always said, I would have liked that movie, King Kong, about 30 or 40% better if Peter Jackson was sitting in the editing room, took a scalpel, and cut off the entire first hour of the movie. If that movie had just started with the boat coming up to the mysterious island and got rid of all that not that useless stuff that was before, and I understand what Peter Jackson was going for. He was going for deep narrative. He was going for you know improved character development. He was going for all that, and I get it. And I understand why he would do that. But when you look at the movie, you gotta go, mm, this movie is best served if we just cut that first hour off. Just cut it out completely. Do about five minutes of character introduction and start this movie with the boat approaching the island. If that had happened, I probably would have liked the movie a lot more. But instead, by, by that first hour, I was already fatigued with the movie. Um, then you get some movies like Lord of the Rings, right? You get a Return of the King where it's, you know, you're sitting in theater and it's an hour or two, uh, sorry, two hours and 45 minutes long or however long it was. And you're going, man, that could have gone another hour. You easily could have gone that another hour. It was already two minutes and 45 seconds. I watched the four hour version. And even, even still, I'm saying that movie could have gone on another 45 minutes, another hour. So really is the answer is there is no answer. Generally speaking, although there are tons of exceptions to this, my personal opinion is if you're doing like straight comedy, you should stick to around the 90 minute mark. Stick to around the hour and a half. So we're talking about our... Um, you know, 40-year-old virgins, uh, anchormans, uh, wedding crasher type of movies. 
Now, there are exceptions, absolutely. I, I'm just saying, generally speaking, I think those types of comedies should be kept to about 90 minutes to, you know, really maximize the impact of the comedy. Um, but then other than that, dude, I, I, I really think every single movie is so specific and individual that you've got to judge it on a case by case basis. And really, I don't know what the, what the overall, the overall arching uh, answer to that is. All right, let's move on to a third question of the day. And the third question today comes to us from Robert Goodwin, who writes, what's up, everyone? Love the show. What do you guys think about having LL Cool J star as Luke Cage in a Heroes for Hire movie? Well, um, thanks a lot for the question, Robert. We've been getting a lot of emails. I think we get like a thousand emails every week. But we get a lot of e- been getting a lot of emails about uh, Luke Cage, about Black Panther, but specifically a lot about Luke Cage and some about Heroes for Hire. Here's my hesitation, okay? I like LL Cool J. I mean, back in the day, I was... Believe it or not, you're, I'm about to get very intimate and share a very personal detail about myself as I take a drink of water there. Um, all right, here we go. Sharing time. I used to be a very heavily involved break dancer. I know that is hard to believe uh, as you look at the gentleman sitting in front of you right now. But I was very hardcore into break dancing. I danced in crews. Uh, I mean, I even did it quote unquote professionally, like as a 14 or 15 year old, I actually got paid to do some break dancing gigs. I used to go to our local roller rink every weekend, dance in, in, uh, in break dancing competitions. I remember the first time I won an, a full body Adidas windbreaker outfit. Yes, I did. Uh, used to cart around the cardboard box and everything. Anyway. I remember back in the day, I mean, I was a big LL Cool J fan back then because I remember, dude, I remember, you know, busting out to rock the bells, <laughs> I mean, and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I loved LL Cool J. And you know what? I really like him as a personality a lot. Like, do you remember that? I think it was called Deep Blue Sea. I might be getting the name of the, the name of the movie wrong, but the shark movie, you know, with Samuel Jackson. I think it was called Deep Blue Sea. And LL Cool J played the chef. And a God-fearing chef. And I thought he was hilarious in that. I really did. I thought he was really funny. I even liked a small part in um, Any Given Sunday with uh, Al Pacino. Uh, I thought I thought he did quite well in that. But here's my hesitation about LL. Is that I don't know that he is a strong enough actor that he could lead a film. And I'm not, I'm not hating on him. I'm, I'm not saying he can't do it because he sucks. I'm not saying that. I've liked him pretty much in the in the smaller supporting roles I've seen him in. I think he's definitely got a niche there. I'm saying I simply don't know that I that I would believe or I could think that he is a strong enough legit Hollywood actor that he could actually put a movie on his shoulders and carry a movie. I don't know that he's that type of a performer. Um, and by the way, for those of you who are wondering, of course, LL is not his real name. Uh, no, no. Um, LL Cool J's real name is uh, uh, James Todd Smith. That's his real name. So where does LL come from? Well, LL Cool J comes from, he used to call himself, he used to, the saying was, ladies love Cool James. Ladies love Cool James, LL Cool J. And that's how his name evolved for those of you who may not have known and maybe were curious about it a little bit. And if you weren't curious, I just wasted you know a minute of your time. Sorry about that. All right, let's move on to the fourth question today. And the fourth question today has the privilege of being given to us by Cody Henderson, who writes, Hey, AMC, I saw the trailer for How to Train Your Dragon 2. Honestly, I am sort of excited for this movie because the first one was creative and I would like to see where they go. What do you guys think about making a sequel? Thanks and keep up the great work. I, I got to tell you too, straight up, uh, unapologetically, I really liked the original How to Train Your, Dra- How to Train Your Dragon and I thought it looked bad. Um, it's, it wasn't a Pixar film, so it looks like, oh, here they go again, trying to rip off Pixar and trying to copy the success of Pixar. But, um, but, honest, but it was really good. The, the cinematography, I know it sounds weird to hear that terminology and talk about animated films, but the cinematography of How to Train Your Dragon was breathtaking, especially all the aerial stuff. Uh, just looked amazing. It looked breathtaking. And there was legitimate drama, dramatic tension in the film. Like the stuff between the lead character and his dad, and I believe his dad was, vo- was uh, voiced by uh, Gerard Butler from 300. He was the voice of the dad. I love that dynamic, that father-son dynamic. I thought it was 
really good, as a matter of fact. So overall, I thought it looked good. It was exciting, visually spectacular, uh, some real heart to it at the same time. And um, yeah, personally, I'm all for it. I'm all for, for going back to those characters. I love the fact that now these main characters, normally in an animated film, you go back and these lead animated kid characters are still the same age, right? But they've done something a little bit different here that I really respect. Now, this dude who I guess was 13 or 14, now he's like 18. Now he's a young man. And his love interest is a young woman and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really intrigued that they've gone in that direction. So yeah, you and me both, dude. I, I'm looking forward to How to Train Your Dragon 2. There you go. I said it. If you're not, that's totally cool. All film subjective, but um, I'm looking forward to it. All right, let's move on to this next question. And the next question comes to us from Will Lambert, who writes... Hello, AMC crew. I have watched the show from episode one. Well, thank you so much, Will. Um, it has been my favorite source of movie news. My question is about Ron Howard. He has directed so many great films, but it seems like no one puts him in the category of an all-time great with, say, Spielberg, Hitchcock, etc. Do you think Howard fits into this category? That is a great question. I actually had... Um, a little bit of a debate on this show once with uh, one of the friends of ours here, uh, uh, Ryan Turek, who's AKA Ryan Rotten, who guy who runs uh, the great horror site, uh, shock to you drop. He was a guest on the show once and he, he, we, I believe the topic of Ron Howard came up and he said he didn't actually even really like Ron Howard that much. I got to tell you, I do. Um, Cause when you look at a guy like Ron Howard, yes, he did the dilemma, but look down uh, the, the list of the movies this guy has done. Backdraft, Apollo 13, Cinderella Man, A Beautiful Mind, Willow, Splash, um, Cocoon. He has two nominations at the Academy Awards for Best Director of the Year. One was for Frost Nixon, which he did not win, but he won the Academy Award for Best Director for A Beautiful Mind, which was an incredible film. Personally, I, I think my favorite movie of his is actually one of his most underrated films, which was Cinderella Man, which also starred uh, Russell Crowe, who starred in his uh, other film, A Beautiful Mind, for which he won an Academy Award. Um, I mean, listen to those names again. Backdraft, Apollo 13, Cinderella Man, A Beautiful Mind, Willow, Splash, Cocoon. He's done comedy, drama. And of course, he's got, you know, some uh, some fan favorite stuff like um, Angels and Demons and, of course, uh, The Da Vinci Code. So he's got that series as well under his belt. Um, he, he's just done a lot of stuff. And look, I know a lot of people hate on it. I liked his The Grinch Who Stole Christmas with Jim Carrey. I liked it. I, I know a lot of people didn't. I'm, I'm probably in the minority and that's cool. All film subjective, but I'm just admitting to you right now that I really liked it. So, um, but now, okay. So you, a very impressive resume, undoubtedly a very impressive resume. Would I throw him in the category of one of the all time greats? If we're creating a Mount Rushmore of the all time great directors, you know, say you're making a list of five, maybe six guys. And you would Ron Howard belong up there with them? That's a great question. I think there's an argument to be had. Uh, I'm not sure that I would put him up there. Um, is he a great director? One of the best of all time? Yes. But is he one of the great, one of the gods? Is he one of those guys? Is he belong up there with Spielberg? Does he belong up there with um, Scorsese? Does he belong up there with Hitchcock? I don't know. I'm not saying I wouldn't put him up there, but I'm saying it's an awesome question. Um, because when you look at that that pantheon of films that he's done, and he's still, for a director, he's still relatively young. He's going to be directing for another 15, 20 years. Let's talk about it again in a few years. Let's see where he goes from here. And let's not forget, he's got that film in theaters, in AMC theaters right now, Rush, uh, with Chris Hemsworth, that everybody's raving about, that everybody just absolutely loves this film. So... He just keeps adding to his resume. Let's revisit the question again in a few years. But I think it's a very valid question that you raise. And it's, you know, we should be talking about it. All right. Let us move on to the last question of the day. And the last question of the day is taking me to task. This question comes from Bradford Donovan, who writes, Hey, AMC Movie Talkers, love the new studio. John has said a number of times that film adaptation of lesser known comic book characters will never be made simply because the general public doesn't know who they are. I feel as though with that train of thought, no original films would ever be made. If a studio like Warner Brothers or Marvel Disney takes a character and sticks to the core essential elements of that character, as John says, 
they can make a film that all audiences can enjoy, whether it's Batman or Buona Beast. Studios shouldn't just try to give us film fans what they know we want to see, but rather films we didn't know we wanted to see. I'm going to disagree with you on that hugely, but I'll get to that in a second. I guess the real question here is what do you mean when you say that studios won't make films of characters that the general public doesn't know? And what's the difference between making a film based on a comic book character and making a film based on a novel or source material? Um, Bradford, I'm glad you brought that up. You raise an excellent point. Um, so let me clarify a little bit. I've never said that studios should never make a, a comic book movie based on a lesser known character because nobody knows who they are. Period. I've, I've never said that. But that is a big, one of the big um, points of consideration that comes into it. But it's not the only thing. It's absolutely not the only thing. For example, um, nobody really knew who Kickass was. And yet they made that. And uh, I love it. I love it. It wasn't a huge financial success, but, but I loved it. And it was really cool. Uh, Blade was a relatively unknown character. Nobody will call Blade a mega blockbuster hit, but it was, it was a hit. It was fun and it was, uh, you know, there you go. Let's not talk about Blade 3 and how bad that was. Um, so, yes, you can take those and make them because, look, when you made The 40-Year-Old Virgin, what I, I think is my all-time favorite comedy, um, nobody had heard of the characters in that movie. Nobody had heard of 40-Year-Old Virgin. Well, of course not. It was a brand new story. Nobody had ever heard of them. So when I'm talking about comic book characters um, and whether or not they're known or unknown, being an unknown character in a comic book film is a big deal, but it is not the only deal. Absolutely not. But there are other elements to bring into consideration. Let me bring up your email again here. I, I want to address a couple of things that you mentioned in your things here. Um, you said this, if a studio like Warner Brothers or Marvel Disney takes a character and sticks to the core essential elements of that character, as John says, they can make a film all audiences can enjoy. To channel my inner Dwight Schrute, False. Absolutely false. Uh, you cannot make um, just any random uh, comic book character movie and stick to their core essential elements and make a movie that everybody can enjoy. False. Because not everything is for everybody. They're, they're just not. So, for example, you can make a Bishop movie. I love the character Bishop in the X-Men universe. It's been one of my favorites for 15 years, 20 years. But I, I'm not going to suggest that Oh, if you make a great Bishop movie and stick to the core essential elements of that movie, mom, mom's going to love it. No, she won't. I know my mom won't. My mom loves Avengers. My mom loves Superman. And I know she would love those movies. And I knew she would before she went to go see them. But I also know she wouldn't be into a Bishop film. If they did it right and stuck to the core essential elements. It went. So I think it's a misnomer to suggest that, hey, if you just take uh, uh, some unknown comic book character and stick to the core essential elements of that character, you can make a movie that everybody will like. False. You're not in, in any more sense that if you make take a, a, a script for a romantic drama and say, hey, if you make this romantic drama and stick to the core essential elements of the script, you're going to make a movie that everybody will enjoy. False. Not true. So and maybe you're not suggesting that maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding the way you're writing it, but I'm just addressing it the way it was written. Um, and, and so I think there's a lot of combo characters you can't do that with. Now, let's look at romantic comedies for a second. With a romantic comedy, studios know there is an audience for romantic comedies. And they know that if they make a certain romantic comedy and they have a certain type of cast, that it can make between this and this at the box office. They know that will work. And so they develop scripts for romantic comedies following certain formulas. And look, everybody thinks formula is a bad, a bad word. It's not. <laughs> Formulas are good. It's good to break out of them once in a while, but well executed. You, you use elements of formulas and it can really help a movie and make it really, really great. Um, there's no movie you can point me to or very, very few movies you can point me to that don't employ certain types of formulas here and there, which, which is good. That's not a lack of creativity any more than saying, oh yeah, that, uh, that world famous chef who baked that cake, bah, he used flour. What a formula. What a going just by the formula chef. No, he just made one of the greatest cakes of all time. So yes, there are, there are certain elements and formulaic elements that should be employed and should be used. Formula is not a bad word, except for when that's all it relies on. So anyway, get it, I ran off on a rabbit trail there. 
So getting back to like say romantic comedies, right? Studios know if they make these movies a certain way that these do appeal to people in certain demographics and that, that, that the movie will hold the potential to make as little as this, as much as this. And, you know, so let's go and make the best movie we can, cast it right, all that kind of stuff. Now that's a different element and a different uh, formula, if you will, than in what they're making a new political thriller. Political thrillers aren't for everybody, but they do know that this ele- audience is out there for political thrillers, and they know that if they cast it this way and this way, put a name like a Russell Crowe in there, uh, and then you know, have it directed by so and so who can bring that element, we know that this movie will make somewhere between this and this if we do it all right and market it right. Uh, comic book films are a little more unique, but the same all at the same time. How's that for irony? Um, in the sense that you know, you can't just make a comic book film and expect that we're going to have this audience to this audience. It's not really the way it works because there's a world of difference between making a comic book film based on that, oh, that what's that character? Uh, Batman. And then making uh, a comic book film based on, oh, who's that other character? Oh, Huntress. That's that's a different thing than saying, um, we're going to make a romantic comedy starring uh, Matthew McConaughey. We're going to make a romantic comedy starring Ryan Gosling. Uh, yeah, of course, there's some differences there, but you know, you, you know what you're getting with a romantic comedy. Some will be great, some will be bad, whatever. With comic book films, though, there there is not that starting audience. You know, I've talked about this a lot before, that those of us who read lots of comic books... Um, and, you know, we, we seem to have this belief that everybody reads comic books. And if you make an Aquaman movie, by the way, I've been reading the new 52 Aquaman. And, and for those of you who suggest I read it, you're right. It gets pretty damn good. The first five or six issues were pretty bad. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm getting so sidetracked today. Anyway, um, you can't just take a comic book movie and understand that, oh, with a comic book genre, you'll get between this and this. No, that's not the way it works. Within the comic book genre... You can make an unknown comic book character. Let's take Blade. But the thing is, Blade capitalized on a few other formulas that they knew would work. Um, Wesley Snipes was already a proven, well-known, badass action hero. Vampires were a very popular thing at the time. They still are, even though they've lost a little bit of the popularity. But Vampires was a hot commodity. And just an original story, forget that it was based on a comic book, of the Daywalker, a a half-vampire who hunts vampires. Boom. That can work. Take the comic book element out of it. That can work. There's an audience there for that. Vampires, you got your Wesley Snipes, you got your, because remember at the time he was a much bigger name than he is now. You got got all those different types of things. Kick-Ass is the same thing, but once again, Kick-Ass was not by, you know, never became big hit material, which kind of proves the other point. But but Kick-Ass, you know, a comedy based on on just average people trying to emulate superheroes and the hilarity that ensues. You know, a little girl who murders people. You know, all that. There are a lot of other elements in there as well. Um, but generally speaking, with comic book character, if you're going to make a movie, if you want to roll the dice and invest $100 million or invest $200 million, and let's face it, a lot of comic book films will require big budgets. All right? A lot of comic book You can't make a Wonder Woman movie for $50 million. You just can't. And not, not make the core fans happy at any rate. You can't make a Martian Manhunter movie for $35 million. You just can't. So a lot of comic book characters require big budgets. And so with big budgets, you need big returns. Because I've already explained a hundred times how, Matt, just because you make a movie for $200 million doesn't mean you break even at $200 million. It means you break even at like $400 million or $350 million. So with big budgets comes the requirement for big box office. And for a comic book film, to get big box office, one of the requirements for this genre is brand recognition. You got to go into it already with a lot of brand recognition. People know who X-Men are. They may know, not know a lot about the X-Men, but they know who the X-Men are. They got to know who Superman is. Maybe not everybody knows all the mythology of Superman, but they know who Superman is. They recognize that name. They know who Captain America is. They know who the Incredible Hulk is. They know who Thor is. They know who the Avengers are. So you got to start with that sort of thing. So yeah, there are a lot of more obscure comic book characters that people say, oh, they should make a movie about this. It'll be great. And that's why I say a lot of times, hey, maybe you can make a great movie, but no one's going to go see it. You know, and the Hollywood studios know that. Now you get a a studio like, and I'm going way over time. I'm sorry, guys. You get a studio like Marvel, right? And they've already got 
like nine films out of their under their belt. By the time Ant Man comes around, they're gonna have like twelve movies under their belt, right? With the cinematic universe is huge now, massive cinematic universe. They're at a point now that they can start rolling the dice a bit more with a character like Ant Man, right? So they're making Ant Man being directed by Edgar Wright. We still don't know who's gonna star. I still really hope it's Nathan Fillion, but I know it's not gonna be. Um, but now that they've got 9, 10, 11, by that point, 12 films in their cinematic universe, big, successful, they've built up this universe, now they can roll the dice with a smaller character in that universe like Ant-Man and trust that the popularity of the overall universe will help buoy that property up. But a lot of comic book characters don't have that, you know, don't have that privilege of already having a 12-film cinematic universe behind it. So you got to be really careful with things like that. So, I mean, it's a big discussion. It's a huge discussion. But the bottom line is I've never said that studios will avoid making a comic book film strictly on the basis that it's an unknown character. You can make a film about an unknown character, but you got to have a lot of other elements there as well to buoy it up to make up for the fact that it doesn't have brand recognition. Most comic book genre type films will require that kind of brand recognition in order to make those films. And when you get a film like Kick-Ass, the odd one that you can make for $20 million or $30 million or whatever, yeah, then you got a little bit more flexibility, right? Because if you don't need a $350 million box office return to a $400 million box office return, then you can roll the dice a little bit more and take a little bit more risks. But if you want to make a movie like, oh gosh, like, uh, you know, I don't know, X-Men Zombies or, you know, Marvel Zombies or or uh, other bigger titles, you want to make a big Galactus um, kind of epic space opera, whatever, you're going to require 150 to $200 million production budget, 40 to $50 million in marketing budget. Then whatever you make at the box office, you'll lose one third of that because that goes to the theater exhibitors. So you're only getting two thirds of the box office return back. So therefore that movie needs to make around $400 million. That's tough. You need big brand recognition. Um, but like in everything else, everything is its own unique circumstance. So anyway, I am sorry I, I blathered on that. I've gone way over time, guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today on AMC Mailbag. I will be back again tomorrow, which will be pre-recorded uh, for Sunday. And then we were back Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's Los Angeles time. That's also 2 p.m. East Coast time, New York and, and Toronto. So 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Find out whatever that is where you live. And we go live. Our AMC Movie Talk Show Monday through Friday now is live at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Just go to www.youtube slash AMC Theaters. Go to our main YouTube page and you'll see it pop up there at 11 o'clock. And you can watch us live, chat with us live. It's, it's a lot of fun. So come on over and join us. So thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia. You can find me on social media at John Campia at either Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye.